morning avinash good morning sir happy diwali sir thank you thank you thank you kalimani regards to all family members sir thank good you good morning dr anand morning sir morning happy diwali to all of you good morning rajinder sir happy diwali to you also sir yeah thank you i think we can start so i see some students there kirti is there kirti can you please come in because today we have an open house session so we will do it like a question and answer rajiv yeah kirti yes, so okay good so can you uh, please introduce yourself which course and which hospital sir i completed my uh, ms general surgery sir mm -hmm. and now doing fellowship under dr banerji sir gi surgery okay okay good so maybe we can start with you and then other students can join dr rajiv you can also unmute yourself and uh, chip in so kirti let's start with you uh, so since today the topic is uh, complications of pancreatic duodenectomy uh, can you briefly tell us so this is like a question answer session in the exam in the practical exam that uh, what are the variants of pancreatic duodenectomy tell us about the variants of pancreatic duodenectomy which you know a classical whipple sir and pylorus preserving pancreatic or duodenostomy okay so what all is included in classical whipples and how pylorus preserving is different sir uh, in classical whipples uh, distal one third of the stomach duod all parts of duodenum and proximal are 10 cm of jejunum Uh, mm -hmm. along with the uh, gallbladder are removed and uh, three anastomoses uh, are done sir gastro jejunostomy sorry sorry so sorry, uh, sorry for interrupting so nothing else is removed you said distal one third of stomach duodenum proximal jejunum gallbladder that's all pancreas sir which part of the head pancreas head of the pancreas head of the pancreas and one more thing which connects gallbladder to the head of the pancreas cbd sir cbd so the correct description is that it includes distal stomach the entire duodenum some part of proximal jejunum gallbladder common bile duct and the head of the pancreas up to the neck Next. and lymphadenectomy lymphadenectomy is only peripancreatic lymphadenectomy okay sir. Yes. yes and recon reconstruction uh, gastro jejunostomy pancreatic jejunostomy and uh, hepatic jejunostomy okay fine uh, although you should remember that some surgeons may not be doing pancreatic jejunostomy they may be doing a pancreatic gastrostomy gastrostomy okay <laughs> so how is the pylorus preserving different and why it was designed that way what was the logic behind it uh, it was thought the uh, if pylorus is preserved the mm -hmm. gastric emptying will, will be reduced but uh, mm -hmm. there are no proven uh, evidences so why was the why was who who designed pylorus uh, preserving traverso and longmeyer okay these were the two surgeons so why did they think that pylorus should be preserved there must be some problem with classical whipples it cannot be a negative reason you said that if pylorus is preserved the gastric emptying will be delayed that is a side effect nobody will design a procedure to um, uh, gain a side effect the new procedure is designed to take care of some problem with the older procedure so what problem of classical whipples they thought will be addressed if the pylorus is preserved it was basically to take care of the nutritional problems of classical whipples okay so they thought if pylorus is preserved uh, the uh, more physiology of the gut will be maintained and uh, the long term nutritional side effects of classical whipples will be less but in the process they found that uh, because of pylorus being preserved the gastric emptying got delayed so delayed gastric emptying in some reports at least uh it was it was shown that in uh, pppd it was more than classical whipples okay any other variant you know very recent okay rajiv raj you can come in dr shyam kumar anybody any other student please come in any new variant of uh, pancreatic duodenectomy 
dunking pan pancreas is uh, is connected to separate true loop mm, okay that is a variant of reconstruction agree you are right but variant in terms of what is resected and what is not no sir sorry something more than pylorus preserving but something less than whipples classical whipples other students please put your microphone on come in dr rajiv ra mm -hmm. yes Reception yes pylorus sir yeah so what is it called pylorus resecting pancreatoid neck like ppr pd devised by uh, some japanese groups and they thought that if pylorus is resected that problem of uh, increased delayed gastric emptying will be taken care of so these are the three variants of pancreatoidectomy okay if if i ask you that what are the complications of pancreatoidectomy how would you answer that uh, immediate complications late complications mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, immediate complications are uh, bleeding infection um, yeah so whenever you are asked uh, for complications of a procedure i think a more uh, systematic way to answer it could be that you could either classify them according to timing so intra operative early post operative and late post operative and then during the follow up after okay. discharge or you could say general complications which can happen in any operation and specific complications which are specific to the procedure that you are discussing okay yes sir hmm. so um, okay we will leave um, uh, the uh, general complications because that they are common to all but you have to remember that because the commonest indication being malignancy most of these patients are either middle age or elderly they usually have some comorbidities they have poor nutrition they may be jaundice they may have organ dysfunction coagulopathy renal dysfunction so their risk of even the general complications is more than any other procedure number one and number two again because of age and uh, malignancy and a long operation uh, the uh, complications like uh, venous thromboembolism are more as compared to other uh, procedures so that is as far as the general complications are concerned and that is why Uh, uh preparation of these patients optimization of these patients what is now called as prehabilitation of these patients is very very important and whenever you are asked to describe the procedure that should become an important component of your description as well as in your clinical practice it is not that you see the patient today and take up the patient for surgery tomorrow they should preferably be given time to optimize them so that you can reduce the complications now let us come to the specific complications so intraoperative what are the problems intraoperative intraoperative uh, bleeding from the ma major vessels mm -hmm. so can you tell us uh, uh, that during a pancreatoidectomy what are the sites from where intraoperative bleeding can occur yes uh, main hepatic gastroduodenal sorry say again mm -hmm. don't worry if even if you are wrong it doesn't matter here if you are wrong that is the purpose of these sessions that you say what you know and then we correct you if you are wrong uh so superior mesenteric artery a gastroduodenal artery but you will reach uh, uh, so do you do you reach these vessels in the beginning of the procedure before you reach these places there are so many other things which you do isn't it so can bleeding occur there what will what will be the initial uh, henley, steps henley is uh, and trunk of henley sir so what is the first step of whipple's procedure after cauterization cauterization so cauterization yeah there may be bleed from uh, during cauterization from retropedal bleed there may be injury to the this uh, gonadal vessel many uh, sometime can be injured okay after that you are right the loop of henley your yeah, trunk of henley trunk of henley is formed by right colic artery uh, superior mesenteric and 
ब्रांच ऑफ मिडिल कोलिक एंड राइट ब्रांच ऑफ so where uh, i don't know whether we have already where do you encounter it where does it where can it bleed at what step of the operation where is it located during cattle brush mm, not really what is cattle brush what is cattle brush you right mobilization of the biodynamic mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Is okay. that cattle brush? Okay. What is mobilization? That is cockerization, sir. Hmm. Mobilization of the colon, sir. Which part of the colon? Right, right, sir. Transverse. The flexure, the upper part of right colon, the hepatic flexure, and the proximal transverse colon. Yeah. So, where do you make the incision when you mobilize the right colon or hepatic flexure? Do you make it on the mesenteric side or on the anti-mesenteric side? it is on the lateral side and uh, uh, on the anti mesenteric side so you should not encounter any vessels there isn't it so the gastrocolic trunk is encountered when you are opening the lesser sac when you are okay. opening the lesser sac to expose the head of the pancreas that is where you can encounter it and yes you are right that is one uh, uh, frequent site where if you are not careful you can have bleeding some other student would like to come in vishal good morning yes. sir i just uh, missed the discussion i think it is about gastrocolic trunk injury sorry vishal is it dr vishal gupta yes sir oh sorry sorry i'm morning, so sorry sir. i'm so sorry i thought it is one of the students no that's fine yeah yeah please carry on yeah please I correct think, sir i just missed the discussion part i think it is about uh, gastrocolic trunk injury during uh, mobilization for yes, yes 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 i think yeah, so, uh, 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 this is important because the uh, venous channels are quite friable at this area so uh, it is very important for the assistant to be very careful during this part of the operation so uh, even a slightest of jerk on the colon can easily injure the any tributary from the uh, colon to the middle colic uh, Uh, even the middle colic, right colic, or any other tributary to the gastrocolic trunk, or even the SMV. So uh, this injury not only involves the gastrocolic trunk, even other some small tributary, and then when they are injured, they bleed very profusely. So the assistant role is very very important during this part of the uh, procedure. Okay, so. Um... Um, yes, Kirti, please carry on. So, what next? One is gastrocolic trunk. Then, any other step? Step for bleeding, sir. Cockerization. Mm -hmm. So, during cockerization, again, since it is done on the anti-mesenteric side, the convex side of duodenum, normally you should not have any vessels there. Yes. unless you get into a wrong plane so that that is why these planes have been described for mobilization of these organs that they are supposed to be a vascular or relatively less vascular planes usually you should not have any named vessels there so what else is mobilized before resecting you mobilize the right colon the hepatic flexure you mobilize the duodenum what else do you have to mobilize before tunnel behind the neck of the pancreas okay so can bleeding occur there uh, if at all in the correct plane no bleeding sir but mm -hmm. if at all uh, uh, we miss the plane so what is the anatomical basis of creation of this tunnel 
why and how is it possible that you can dissect there without being able to see what is there and still you don't have any bleeding what is the anatomical basis uh, we have to stay in the anterior surface of the vein sir which vein remain in the uh, anterior surface of the uh, smb of the what vein lies behind the neck of the pancreas smb and portal vein and then the splenic vein laterally so the the anatomical basis is that normally there are no tributaries draining from the pancreas into the anterior surface of the portal vein or the superior mesenteric vein behind the neck of the pancreas that is why unless there has been inflammation unless there is malignant infiltration this is a normally dissectable avascular loose areolar plane where you can make a, a tunnel between the anterior surface of the smv portal vein splenic vein junction and the posterior surface of the neck of the pancreas but if there is say previous inflammation suppose patient had had acute pancreatitis or patient has chronic pancreatitis where there is a lot of peri pancreatic inflammation and fibrosis or if there is a tumor which is infiltrating the vein then if you try to create a tunnel then you can cause injury to the portal vein and you will have torrential bleeding which you will find it impossible to control because the vein is not exposed so these days with better imaging you know whether the vein is free or not and if the vein is suspected to be involved on pre operative imaging then you should not try to make a tunnel then what do you do how do you proceed with the resection sma first approach sir that is not the, the sma first approach is to see whether the artery is involved or free because you don't want to take an irreversible step if the artery is involved because most people would not go ahead and do an arterial resection the approach is that you don't try to make a tunnel you divide the neck of the pancreas mm. go down from anterior to posterior surface and then expose the vein once the whole neck of pancreas has been divided and then decide first you see whether the vein is really involved or not and then you decide that what you are going to do with the vein so in th these cases tunneling should not be done in fact a lot of people now believe that tunneling is of historical importance because if it is a small periampullary carcinoma on imaging then you know that uh, the tunnel uh, or the plane will be it, there because there is no mass which can be involving the vein so tunneling was of importance when all these imaging techniques were not available uh, to assess the resectability but today resectability is better assessed on pre operative imaging rather than the intra operative except the arterial involvement other students please come in dr rajiv dr shyam kumar okay so other steps so one is um, uh, making the tunnel but before making the tunnel there are some other structures which need to be mobilized you said some other uh, parts some other viscera are resected they need to be mobilized can bleeding occur there so gallbladder needs to be mobilized isn't it and mobilization of gallbladder in whipples is usually more messy more bloody as compared to in gallstone disease because these are enlarged distended gallbladders which are more vascular so sometimes you can have bleeding from the gallbladder bed itself and then jejunum if if it is a thick fat laden jejunal mesentery then while you are trying to dissect in the jejunal mesentery you can either have bleeding or if you are not very careful you can cause injury to the main vessels because at the dj the, the main superior mesenteric pedicle artery and vein are very close so there are two approaches to taking the jejunum one is that you stay very close to the bowel wall where either you keep on ligating and dividing or use an energy source and other is that if the mesentery is uh, uh, can be illuminated uh, with light trans illumination and you can see the vessels then you take the jejunal branches of the superior mesenteric vessels the advantage of staying close to the mesentery is that you are less likely to cause injury to the main vessels but then you get multiple pedicles the advantage of staying away from the mesentery is that you take only one or two pedicles but you have to be careful that you don't cause injury to the main superior mesenteric artery and vein what else where where else specific 
bleeding what other what? separating the head of pancreas uh, uh, bleeding can occur from superior uh, superior and uh, inferior pancreatic when while separating yeah. the head from superior mesenteric vessels so uh, which part of the pancreas has small vessels which drain from the pancreas directly into the superior mesenteric vein usually you encounter very small very fragile veins which are draining directly into the superior mesenteric vein so if you cause an injury one you can have torrential bleeding and second it can virtually become like a hole in the superior mesenteric vein so these are vessels which drain from the uncinate process directly into the superior mesenteric vein okay and then you are right that there are superior and inferior pancreatico duodenal vessels which are if it is an artery it is arising directly from the sma and if it is a vein it is draining the inferior one drains directly into the smv and the superior one drains superior pancreatico duodenal vein posterior drains into the portal vein so from the main portal vein there is usually only one tributary which is the posterior superior pancreatic the post the anterior superior pancreatic duodenal vein joins the pan, uh, the gastrocolectrum the one which we were discussing earlier but the posterior superior pancreatic duodenal vein will drain into the main portal vein okay i see dr sujata has joined sujata would you like to come in and continue the discussion what else so you have taken care of the anterior the superior uh, and inferior pancreatic duodenal veins what what is the last part which is removed what which is divided when you are doing the resection what is the last component usually in the standard procedure what is mesopancreas you know what is mesopancreas yes sir during embryology uh, pancreas also has a uh, mesentery which later uh, fuses with the uh, uncinate process retroperitoneum mm -hmm. it expands from uncinate to the sma so during the surgery where do you encounter at what stage do you encounter mesopancreas and what does it usually contain lymphatic sir mm -hmm. so it is that once you have divided everything which means we have divided we have mobilized the gall bladder we have divided the cbd we have made the tunnel we have divided stomach or duodenum we have mobilized the jejunum we have divided the jejunum we have taken the jejunum from left to right we have divided the neck of the pancreas now the whole specimen is in the left hand of the surgeon now what is attaching the specimen to the patient is what is the mesopancreas which as you rightly said is in the retroperitoneum so it is the uh, soft tissue structure which is attaching the head and uncinate process of the pancreas to the superior mesenteric vessels so usually the mesopancreas will contain the superior pancreatic duodenal artery which is arising from the uh, sma and then going into the pancreas the inferior you have already taken when you were separating the uncinate process from the superior mesenteric vessels and what is the surgical importance of meso one is that you you have to take care of it because if you just divide it it will bleed so there are various ways of taking it either you take it in bits and pieces so you take small bits in right angle forceps ligate and divide if it is not very thick some people may use an energy source to just keep on dividing it or some people may put a clamp across it and divide and then uh, under run it so depending on the length and the thickness of the mesopancreas there are different ways that you can handle it but you you have to ensure hemostasis because it would usually contain the uh, pancreatic duodenal artery the superior one and what is the yes. importance of mesopancreas in which procedure to achieve, or, or, mm -hmm. to achieve r0 resection sir yes the margin so that is important especially when you are dealing with a carcinoma of the head of the pancreas or uncinate process that it is one of the margins which is likely more likely to be positive so you should always mark 
uh, all the margins, especially the mesopancreas, uh, to see whether it is positive or not. So this is as far as intraoperative bleeding is concerned. Now let us come to the postoperative complications. So what are the postoperative complications specific to pancreatic Pan bleeding? Pancreatic leak. Pancreatic mm -hmm. leak and mm -hmm. uh, COPF. What is the difference between the two? Same, sir. Same. So you should say that postoperative complication in any procedure you have to mention bleed as a post-operative complication, isn't it? Yes. Because sir. that will be one of the early complications. So bleed can occur from any of these places which we have discussed. Whatever vessels you have ligated and divided or you have taken care of with the, uh, an energy source, you can have bleed from there. Uh, so you, how, how do you uh, classify? What is the term used for describing bleed following pancreatoduodenectomy? There is a specific term. What is it called? So it is called PPH, post pancreatectomy hemorrhage. Okay, that is the term coined by the International Study Group on Pancreatic Surgery (ISGPS). So it is called yes. PPH, post pancreatectomy hemorrhage, uh, which, uh, as the name suggests, it is not only following PD. Uh, um, but also following distal pancreatectomy, any pancreatectomy. So, do you know how the bleed is classified? How PPH is classified? No, no sir. So, it is classified number one based on timing, early or late. And uh, according to ISGPS, a bleed which occurs within 24 hours is early, and after 24 hours is late. Although many pancreatic surgeons don't agree with this, they feel that even up to three days or five days should be early. But as of today, for your exam point of view, that is what it is. Early is within 24 hours and late is after 24 hours. Then it is classified as the site of bleeding. Whether it is intraluminal, that means in the jejunal limb, or whether it is extraluminal or intraabdominal, which is in the peritoneal cavity. And the third criterion is the severity of bleed, whether it is mild or severe. So early I, and late, I have already told you, intraluminal, in je jejunal bleed, it can be from the pancreatic cut stump. It can be from the hepatico jejunostomy, which is very, very uncommon. Or it could be from the gastro or duodeno jejunostomy. Gastro is more common because stomach is more vascular. It could be intra-abdominal, which means it is outside the lumen. And that is usually surgical bleed from one of the vessels where <coughs> the ligature has given way. Or it could be from the pancreatic bed, wherever you have dissected the organs from. Because of coagulopathy, there is what is known as medical bleed or coagulopathic bleed, which is a diffuse ooze. And sometimes you can have a combined intraluminal and extra, extra luminal, that is intraabdominal bleed, that there is a bleed into the jejunum and the jejunum gets distended. It disrupts the anastomosis, most commonly the pancreatic anastomosis, and that, that blood comes in the peritoneal cavity. And the last is that there is a pancreatic leak which forms a peripancreatic collection. That collection gets infected it forms an abscess. That abscess then erodes into one of the stumps and causes bleed. So that is intraabdominal bleed. Now the difference between surgical intraabdominal bleed and this uh, bleed which occurs because of erosion of a vascular stump causing pseudoaneurysm is the timing. Surgical intraabdominal bleed occurs early. So that is why they have classified as within 24 hours. That means the ligature has slipped. Um, or a ligature has given way or it is a coagulopathy which is uh, the cause of bleed. Whereas leak causing bleed will occur later. It usually occurs after 5 days, 7 days, 10 days. So you can have early or late, intraluminal or intraabdominal, mild or severe bleed. Okay? Yes, sir. So suppose you see blood on day 1 in the drain. How would you classify this bleed depending on what I have told you? Early, early post pancreatic hemorrhage mm -hmm. and early, extra luminal. 
yes early intra abdominal bleed okay yes and then depending on the amount depending on the fall in hemoglobin depending on hemodynamic instability you can classify a need for transfusion you can classify it as mild or severe so what will you do you see blood on day 1 in the drain what will you do uh, first uh, uh, check for a hemodynamic stability okay okay so as as we as we discussed we classify it into either mild or severe suppose it is mild what will you do uh observation sir and uh, blood yeah. transfusion yeah so early required. early intra abdominal bleed which is mild that means there is no hemodynamic instability there is no fall in hemoglobin just keep a watch so basically you are watching whether it remains mild it gets lighter it gets controlled on its own or it becomes severe and if there is if there was evidence of coagulopathy which means the patient was jaundiced there was some derangement of inr you gave vitamin k pre op then you continue the same it continue to support the coagulation with vitamin k and ffp and hope that this bleed will stop if it is because of coagulopathy a small surgical bleed also suppose it is a small vessel which has given way by the normal process by contraction and coagulation it should stop on its own so if it stops on its own without causing any derangement uh, in hemodynamics or hemoglobin nothing needs to be done suppose it is large amount suppose there is significant fall in hemoglobin suppose there is hemodynamic instability so it becomes severe bleed then what do you do how do you manage early severe intra abdominal extra luminal bleed what is the management so like any other early post operative bleed unless you are sure that it is coagulopathy it is diffuse ooze which sometimes may be very difficult to say the treatment is basically re exploration re operation and surgical control of the bleed because the most likely cause as we discussed is a ligature which has given way from a vessel usually an artery so best to control it is surgical although there are some reports where even for this early severe intra abdominal bleed people have said that first you should do a ct angio and if it is an arterial bleed you can try embolization and then avoid re operation but i think both groups would believe in doing a re operation for early severe intra abdominal bleed okay okay so next scenario is that you see blood in the rice tube what does that mean early intra luminal okay what will you do uh we can uh, do a careful endoscopy and try to control the bleed so again whether you intervene intervene means either for diagnosis or for management depends on the severity of the bleed so if you see small amount of blood which is not causing any hemodynamic instability uh, which is uh, not causing any fall in hemoglobin uh, patient is otherwise all right uh, as we discussed earlier the three common sites are from the stomach from the pancreas cut stump and then last is the hepatic ostomy so why do you want to do endoscopy what is the purpose uh, diagnose the uh, area of the bleed and if possible cauteries yeah therapeutic so, yes so most important is to uh, uh, see the site of bleed not the area the site of bleeding and then if it is from the gastro or duodenal anastomosis then there are several ways by which you can control it endoscopically so do you know of the methods to control the bleed endoscopically what gadgets the endoscopists use yes sir uh, clipping mm -hmm. in uh, injection of sclerotherapy sclerosent mm -hmm. anything else can be injected other than sclerosent uh, cauteries or argon plus okay anything else can be injected you should listen to the question carefully so one is injecting sclerosant any other during It surgery when we want to reduce bleed what do we infiltrate the area with 
Uh, adrenaline, sir. So you can inject adrenaline. You can inject sclerosant. You can use cautery. You can use argon plasma. You can use clip. So these are various ways by which the endoscopists can control a bleed, which they can see. Okay. Now it is very difficult for an endoscopist to go right up to the pancreatic anastomosis, although. A very expert, experienced endoscopist can do that, and they have done that. And if that can be done, you can go first, then you go in the proximal jejunal limb across the DJ or GJ. First, you will encounter the hepatic jejunosmi, so you will see bile coming into the jejunum. And then you go more beyond that, about 10 centimeter. At the end of the jejunal limb, you will see the pancreatic stump. So if it was the whole stump which has been anastomosed to the jejunum, with a large opening in the jejunum, then you will see the cut surface of pancreas. But if it is a mucosa to mucosa anastomosis, you will not see the cut surface of pancreas. You will only see the ductal opening. But if the whole cut surface of pancreas neck has been anastomosed to a large opening in the jejunum, and if you have an expert endoscopist, experienced endoscopist, he or she can go right up to there, see the bleed from the cut surface of pancreas, and using one of these methods can control this bleed. So there are reports and uh, even at SCPGI, my colleagues can uh, could do that in some of the cases, okay? But suppose you, you have an average skilled endoscopist. So we do an endoscopy. We don't see that the bleed is from the GJ or DJ. Uh, we go into the proximal jejunal limb, a lot of blood and clots we see in the proximal jejunal limb. Then the most likely diagnosis is that this is from the pancreatic cut surface. What will you do? Endoscopist says, I can't reach there. Or I, I can go, but it is all full of blood. I can't see anything. Re-exploration. So what do you do at re-exploration? Dismantle the anastomosis. Mm -hmm. Identify. Which anastomosis? Dismantle which? Pancreatic or anastomosis. So at this level, when you are an MCH student, I expect that each... And every answer of yours should be complete and correct. So don't say anastomosis. Say because everybody knows there are three anastomoses. So obviously the next question will be which anastomosis. So in the first instance, you should have said pancreatic anastomosis. Yes, Is sir. there any other way to control this bleeding without dismantling the anastomosis? That open from the opposite side. Opposite to mesentery yogi. Because you do the anastomosis on the anti-mesentric side. Away from the anastomosis. And... So if the whole cut surface of the pancreatic neck, now this is where you have to know what procedure was done, especially if you were not the operating surgeon, that what kind of anastomosis was done. As we know, there are two types of, broadly speaking, there are two types of pancreatic anastomosis. One is where the entire cut surface of the pancreas is joined to the jejunum, either to the end of jejunum, or to the side of jejunum, which means that if it is to the side of jejunum, there is a large opening in the jejunum, which is almost the same size as the cut surface of pancreas. So some surgeons call it pancreatojejunostomy. On the other hand, it could be only a mucosa to mucosa anastomosis, a simple mucosa to mucosa four layer, or a Bloomgart anastomosis, where only a small opening is made in the jejunum, side of jejunum on the anti-mesentric surface, and the duct is anastomosed to the jejunum. The rest of the pancreas cut surface is covered by the serosa of the jejunum. So if it is the first type of anastomosis, pancreatojejunostomy, the next one, the ductal anastomosis is called pancreaticojejunostomy. Subtle difference. So then one way to control bleed is that don't dismantle the anastomosis. Make a jejunotomy parallel to the anastomosis about a centimeter or two centimeter, depending on how much is the distance, so that you don't compromise the vascularity of the anastomosis. And from inside the jejunum, you see the cut surface of pancreas. So usually you will see an arterial sputter there, and then you control it with bipolar or a fine suture or whatever method you want to use. Okay, and then close the jejunotomy. So the advantage is that you can control the bleed but at the same time, you have not dismantled the anastomosis. Yes. The other is dismantle, but don't say dismantle. You say, I will take down the anterior layer of the anastomosis. So you just take the anterior layer. So that separates the jejunum from the 
cut surface of pancreas, posterior rear is still intact. And then you see the cut surface, control the bleed, and then redo the anterior layer. So for control okay. of bleeding, hardly ever you will require to completely dismantle the anastomosis. It is usually taking down only the anterior layer. Even if you have done a mucosa to mucosa anastomosis, once you take the anterior layer or the transpantriatic sutures or Blumgart anastomosis, the cut surface of the pancreas will be in front of you. So you don't have to dismantle the duct to mucosa anastomosis. You just want to see the cut surface. And usually the pancreatic duct is very close to the posterior surface. So most of this cut surface of pancreas is anterior to the duct, which you will be able to see. Then you control the bleed and then you do redo the anterior layer of the four layer duct to mucosa anastomosis or the gland to mucosa anastomosis. So okay. very rarely you will have to completely dismantle the anastomosis for a bleed, as opposed to as if time permits, we will discuss that if you have to re-explore for a leak and if it is a major disruption, you may have to dismantle the anastomosis, close the jejunum, and drain the pancreatic duct externally to convert it into an external pancreatic fistula. Okay? Okay, sir. Hmm. Fine. So that is as far as... Now, before we move on, uh, tell me that uh, of the specific complications in terms of uh, incidence, which is the commonest complication of PD? Delayed gastric emptance. Yeah. So in terms of numbers, DG is the most common, but DG is troubling, but usually not life-threatening. And that is why we pay less attention to that. We pay more attention to these complications, bleed and leak, which are less common as compared to DG, but they are more dangerous. They can be life-threatening. They can be fatal if they are not appropriately managed. Okay, let us come to leak now. So how do you suspect that there could be a leak? General condition of the mm -hmm. patient... Uh... Like, patient will be having tachycardia, mm, vague abdominal good. discomfort, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, on drain uh, drain amount will be increased and drain amylase lipase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like any other anastomotic leak, if the patient is not doing along the expected course in terms of general condition which means pain, discomfort, distension of the abdomen. In terms of vital signs, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypoxemia, hypotension, and in terms of abdominal findings, you expect the abdomen to be soft, not distended, non-tender, having some bowel activity, maybe on not even day one, but at least day two, day three. So if the patient is not progressing along the expected lines, then you start suspecting that there is something wrong. And something wrong after a PD means a leak unless proved otherwise. Okay? Yes. So you said something about drain fluid amylase. Do you know of some recommendations about drain fluid amylase? What do many centers do? Yes, sir. Uh, as a protocol, uh, we send the drain, serum amylase and drain amylase uh, mm -hmm. uh, on post-operative three Four and five. Yeah. So there are if several all, reports. Yeah. Carry on. Carry on. If at all, uh, the drain amylase is three times more than the uh, serum amylase, uh, then it is it is labeled as uh, leak and it is classified as three types. Type A, yeah. B, and C. So uh, different groups follow different regimes. Some people even do a day, day one drain fluid amylase. They say that if day one drain fluid amylase is low, it is a strong predictor that you are less likely to have an anastomotic leak, uh, day three, day four. So yes, drain fluid amylase is, is an important parameter uh, to either diagnose or to predict a leak. And as you rightly said, that it is classified into three. Do you have any predictors of leak? Are there any patients where you think that there are more chances of leak? Yes, sir. Uh... Soft pancreas and duct diameter, narrow duct diameter. Yeah, so these are two Western strongest, PM. yeah, two strongest predictors of pancreatic anastomotic leak are the consistency of the pancreas and the duct diameter. How do you assess the consistency of the pancreas? Uh, 
<laughs> Intraoperatively by palpation. Mm -hmm. More than palpation, anything else? So one practical way of assessing the consistency or the softness or firmness of the pancreas is that before Sleep you divide, yeah, yes, carry on. Slip page of these sutures, not holding these sutures. Mm, very good. So before dividing the neck of the pancreas, most surgeons will take stay sutures on either side, on the anterior border, on the, sorry, superior border and inferior border. So one on the specimen side and one on the patient side. So four stay sutures, which you take a bite and some people will even tie it to take care of the uh, superior and inferior pancreatic vessels. That is the time when you can best assess the consistency. If that suture is cutting through the parenchyma, you know that the gland is soft. So you have to be very careful. If that suture holds well, then you know that the gland is firm. So consistency and duct diameter are the two strongest risk factors. There are other factors also. Uh, uh, blood loss, transfusion, hypotension during surgery, obesity, uh, whether you saw a lot of fat uh, in the pancreas on CT scan, <clears throat> other uh, factors for wound healing, diabetes and all. But these are the two strongest risk factors. Okay. Yes. So how do you classify this uh, pancreatic leak? You said there are three groups. Yes, sir. Type A is biochemical leak, sir, where a uh, patient is asymptomatic, but only the drain uh, amylase uh, is raised. Mm -hmm. uh, more than uh, three times more than the serum amylase. Mm -hmm. uh, type B is a patient will be having symptoms along with the biochemical leak, but no end organ damage. Mm -hmm. Type C is uh, A, B, and with end organ damage. For type A, uh, it is uh, type C requires intervention. Sir. I think uh, all of you should know the exact uh, definitions of ABC as defined again in the ISGPF. Uh, that was initially it was called International Study Group for Pancreatic Fistula, which then expanded later to include other conditions also, other complications also. So now it is called ISGPS, International Study Group for Pancreatic Surgery. Okay. So uh, since we have only a few minutes, what is the Principle of management of a pancreatic anastomotic leak. Broad outline. Adequate drainage, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, and type A, type B requires there's a supportive care. Mm -hmm. Type C requires intervention, sir. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, lavage and adequate drainage, sir. Few studies have shown uh, converting pancreatico jejunostomy to pancreatico gastrostomy, but uh, no efficacy is proven till now. So, still the adequate drainage remains the mainstay. So, does it always require surgical intervention? You said lavage, you said converting the pancreatic anastomosis to a gastrostomy. That means surgery. Not always, sir. Nothing short of surgery? Sir? Pancreatic anastomotic leak, nothing short of surgery. Reoperation always required. Pigtail, sir. Minimally USG guided uh, drainage. So the correct answer would be that as soon as there is a suspicion of a pancreatic anastomotic leak, uh, it is mandatory to evaluate the patient with a cross sectional imaging CT scan to see if there is any collection. As you were rightly saying, it is not the leak which is important. It is the collection. So you have to look for a peripancreatic collection as a result of the leak. And if there is a collection, that has to be drained. So if it is a localized, single loculus, accessible collection, then in most cases, it will be an image-guided percutaneous catheter drainage of the collection. Again, the aim is to convert it into a controlled external pancreatic fistula, which we know is going to close in most of the cases over a period of time. If it cannot be accessed uh, by PCD, if it is multi-loculated, if it is deep-seated, if after PCD also a patient is not improving, you do a repeat imaging, there is a residual collection, or sometimes if there is a leak combined with a bleed which cannot be controlled by angiographic uh, embolization, then patient may require a re-operation. And as we discussed earlier, when you are re-operating for a pancreatic anastomotic leak, again, the aim is drainage. 
So you drain all the collections, you do a good peripentriatic lavage, and you provide good wide drainage. Depending on the extent of disruption, suppose it is a minor disruption, then this is all that is required. If it is a major disruption, you can see the cut surface of pantreas, sutures have cut through or given way. Then you may have to dismantle the anastomosis, close the jejunum opening, and drain the pantreatic duct externally as an external pantreatic fistula. So you put an infant feeding tube into the pantreatic duct. If omentum is available, you can take the tube through the omentum, plug the omentum or stitch the omentum to the tissue around the pantreas and then bring the tube out. So that is the safest uh, option available. There are so many other things which have been described, but by and large, when you are reoperating, and this will usually happen after a few days, the tissues are edematous, friable, they will not hold sutures. So any attempt at a re-repair of the anastomosis or a redoing of the anastomosis, like you said, that you anastomose the pancreas to stomach. It has been described, it can work out in some cases, but by and large, it is not possible, it is not advisable, it will not work. So by and large, the principle of management is this external drainage to convert the leak into a controlled external biliary uh, pancreatic fistula. And in some cases, once you take the infant feeding tube out, that fistula may close on its own. And in other cases, you may even have to go in and do a re-anastomosis after maybe a few months time when everything inside has settled. So this is by and large the principle of management of a major pancreatic anastomotic leak. But most of the complications of PD today uh, in a center where facilities for therapeutic endoscopy and interventional radiology are available, can be and should be managed by non-surgical intervention as far as possible. Rajin, Avinash, Dr. Banerjee, you want to add something? But I'm sorry, other students, uh, 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 I'm, I'm very unhappy. You should chip in, you should unmute yourself. Today, uh, uh, good, very good, Kirti. You have uh, fielded all the questions uh, single-handedly, very good. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Can I sir? Yes, yes. Sir, good morning, I'm yeah. Dr. Banerjee. Yes, Dr. Banerjee. <laughs> Sir, Kirti is my student. She is doing a fellowship in GIS. She is not an MCA student, but uh, she is a good student. She has just yes. completed her uh, MS surgery and now has joined fellowship. We have a one year fellowship course in GIS surgery and HPV. At present, we are still not running an MCA course, but we will start a GNB course very soon at Bharti uh, Vidya Medical College in Pune. But I must say that she did as well as an MCH student. Good. Very good. good. Very good. She has been, she has been a good PG uh, student also. Now, I'm happy that she has answered the question well. Thank you, yes. sir. Yes. Yeah, Rajendra, you wanted to say something. Yeah, she has handled the questions well. I just want to, I just know, wanted to know whether she is aware of clave and dindo classification. Uh, sorry, please say again. Clave and dindo classification of pancreatic complications. Uh, that is for uh, any complication. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. You. Uh, so, Kiti, what Dr. Desai is saying that you should know the clavian dindo classification of any postoperative complication also, where depending on the severity of the complication, depending on the need for re intervention and what uh, systemic effects the complication is having, they are classified. So, all these classifications all students should know specifically more so for your theory paper but even in yes. clinical examination yes so uh, uh, kirti please send me a mail vkkapoor.india at gmail.com other students also although you did not participate but uh, you can also send me a mail just write pd in the uh, subject of the mail and then i will uh, send you the chapter on complications of pd where some more questions have been addressed okay Yes, sir. thank you, sir. Shall we close the session then? Thank you. Thank you, Kirti. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very well much. Well done. Thank you. Sir.